When we look at OPEC, it's important to look at, you know, they put out their October research that shows what their projections are for supply demand. And it, it's, it's important because they obviously cut supply and where is demand? Because that is, I think, the biggest crux of, well, when politicians, like I think Manchin wrote an open letter to OPEC, uh, you know, the, it's now uh, coming back into the U.S. lexicon and into the government you're seeing more commentary from Europe. And it's interesting because as, as those that followed us last week in our EIA show and FSC show, we said that the actual cut is closer to about 750 to 800,000 barrels a day. So it's interesting, or I should say not surprising, to see that their world oil demand for 2022 in the fourth quarter, the rev- it was revised lower by 780,000 barrels. So you're getting a cut of what equates to between 750 and 800, and you reduce demand by 780. And they can now point to this and say, well, you know, guys, calm down. This is why we did it. We see demand coming down, so we reduce supply. You know, and, and that's what they can argue back and forth. And it's going to be interesting to see because based on if their new estimate is still over 100 million barrels a day, there, we're still going to get draws, and, and that's going to be the, the problem that people are having when you look at, well, we're still going to get draws. You're still going to support pricing. It's still going to be bad for inflation. This isn't helpful, and, and that's going to be that back and forth to what do you point to when you're looking at where that demand is going to be? And they can say, well, it's, it's fourth quarter. We have winter. It's always a strong period, but it'll soften up, and we're, not gonna, we're, we're still going to be supportive of, of uh, supply, balancing the market, you know, and, then, and then continue to jawbone. But this is the data that's going to be important when you go forward. As we said last time they put it out, they were overstating demand. Uh, so to see it re- written down is not a huge surprise. It's just the number is very important when you're looking at it from a political standpoint as well as a physical, a physically available standpoint because the UAE, we still don't think is going to, uh, to adhere. They've already been over their target. Iraq has already come out and said they're not willing to or unable to maintain that level. So again, there's, that's, where, that's why even though if you do all the math, it's closer to about 850, 900,000 barrels, we think it's going to be a bit lower. So then when you look at world oil demand, you know, they took it down through 2023. You can see the, the bigger write down in general uh, in terms of their estimates. And, and again, a recession is going to eat into a lot of these numbers and you'll start to see that get scaled back. China still remains a bit aggressive versus where they currently sit, as well as, you know, when you think about the U.S., the U.S. is something closer you know, around this level, it's just going to be a matter of what do the emerging markets do? How do things set up going forward? And that's going to be important when you look at some of the future expectations, because if they start to write down demand further, based on what they've commented, they'll continue to move supply down as well. Then when you look at current crude production, this is what we were talking about when you look at Iraq currently sitting and, and again, using secondary sources at 4.518. You know, there's they're, they're going to maintain that, which it should be lower. The UAE is currently at 3.193. Technically, that should be reduced. But uh, again, you're, you're seeing where some of that pushback, where right now uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is at 10.99. They should be at about 10.45. You know, that is where we'll see, I think, the lion's share where Saudi Arabia will roll that out while Russia, all the other entities continue to be uh, drawn down. And then when you look at Libya, and again, Libya is not part of this, but they're currently sitting at about 1.15. That's going to remain the case. And then the issue is going to be Iran now, as we talked about in last week's uh, last week, and then again this week. We've continued to see the protests that have now spread where the petrochemical and the oil uh, guys are supporting those, uh, those protests, which the last time that happened was 1979 when they got that support, and that was a big uh, pivot in terms of driving change. Now, when you look at U.S. exports, U.S. exports uh, for crude, I mean, they technically came down, uh, you know, the, the, but as we said, it's always the average. Like, remember last week we said that 4.55 uh, 
million was too high. Well, this week it was 2.87. That's too low. Again, it's the blend. And if you look at the four week rolling average, we're at about 3.9. You know, we're, we're still in that 3.7, 3.8 million barrels a day is the right number based on the demand that remains in the market. So then when we pivot out and we look, you know, you've seen a little bit more tightness in the market uh, on the other side. So while the Dubai swap has gotten, uh, you know, in terms of backwardation has gotten flatter, which uh, uh, shows a bit of looseness. When you look at Brent, it's gotten a bit more expensive, you know, moving closer to $7 now as that creeps up. But that's the, the, the difference where Europe has gotten a little bit tighter, you know, West Africa, a little bit tighter, Middle, uh, Middle East, a little bit, um, a little bit cheaper. And those are some of the dynamics that will help balance out in terms of where people were, are going to be sourcing their crude as crude oil on the water still continues to grind higher, reaching a, the new seasonally adjusted record. That's going to continue to be the case, obviously, with how much Russian crude is going into the world. Then when you look at crude oil in transit, again, all of that is, is remaining in transit. So we had some of that floating storage going into transit. Some of it is still, again, kind of slow steaming as they time the deliveries because uh, you know China is going into a fairly slow period right now as everyone focuses on the Chinese Communist Congress. And that's going to be something to consider as we go over the next few, uh, few weeks. Floating storage came down. Uh, a lot of that is, again, getting pulled onshore as we've seen onshore storage going higher. And then some of that floating storage has gone into transit, a lot of that being from the West African and the U.S. front as obviously floating storage has come down. U.S. had zero. A lot of that came back onshore, which is why we had a sizable build. So again, there's, there's that timing delay. So we still continue to see this trending closer to 2021 levels. Asian floating storage came down. Uh, and and we, when you look at it, a lot of that is going from floating storage to onshore storage. You know, we've talked about how they've adjusted some of their quotas, which put some of the bearishness on the refined product side. You know, so, so far what they've announced for uh, imports is actually fairly low on the crude side. So you're seeing some guys trying to, to get in front of that, trying to get some of those different uh, flows. So the, the amount of tankers t uh, uh, t uh, targeting Asia out and China specifically has increased, which again is going to drive that floating storage a bit higher. West Africa, fairly flat. Again, you should start to see some of those uh, numbers get a little bit better. Uh, but then obviously the Middle East side, as we showed in segment one, the Middle East is coming back to a 2022 record for the amount of floating storage available. And that's going to, uh, to again, uh, again, push some of those discounts, which will be the competition between West Africa and, and um, the Middle East. And then as you look at China's uh, super tankers, you can see that it's broken to new seasonally adjusted highs and actually the highest for 2020, uh, 2022. And that's going to be a big thing that, again, is going to drive some of that floating storage as you start to see. Uh, remember, the, they've been trying to get the SOEs back to about 85% utilization rate from 75. And this is, the, again, there's a lot of buying ahead of that. And a lot of that is showing up here. On the floating uh, on the uh, U.S. exports, uh, gasoline increased by 256,000 barrels a day. That's 344,000 above the five-year. Distillate came down. Remember, a little lumpy. Uh, that we think is going to stay a little bit depressed just because there's more now economics going to pad two and pad one. So we should see some of that stay internal. Still remain elevated, but not to the same degree as it was. And then when you look at propane, propylene, you know, still remaining all uh, all time high, uh, you know, seasonally adjusted record, 1.518 million, 133,000 above last last week, 497,000 above the five year. Again, going to stay very strong. Then when we look at just some of the the numbers here, gasoline's going to stay above that five year average. Again, holding to the top end of that cloud. When you look at distillate, it's come down, but still going to remain above the five-year because they're going to try to balance pad three. The economics are still very strong going into the international world, and that's going to keep flows moving through as ethane uh, continues to remain robust, coming down a bit. But again, a lot of seasonality as well as timing in that. So we will see that ramp back up. And then as we talked about with oil exports, it's come down, but the four-week rolling average is still supportive of that 3.7 million. 
Then when you look at propane, propylene, still seasonally adjusted all-time highs, high end of the cloud, going to stay strong, you know, especially as we get more of that storage remaining elevated, that'll support, you know, keep our pricing fairly competitive, even as shipping rates continue to move higher. When we look at Fujara, uh, Fujara reported uh, 24.92 million, which was a build of 47,000 barrels. Light Distillate had a drop uh, of 252,000 barrels to 7.55. But the East of Suez gasoline complex got worse and softened following the release of the new Chinese oil product export quotas, possibly increasing overall supply and putting that additional down press, downward pressure, which we talked about. India gasoline consumption fell 5.96% on the month, but rose 8.8% on the year. So again, you're starting to see some of that back and forth, but the month-on-month decrease came amid an extended rainy season uh, this year in northern India. So there's some of that back and forth, but more Chinese product coming into the market just as Singapore remains at an all-time high for the amount of gasoline and storage. And this is that backdrop that we've been talking about of gasoline oversupply and distillate shortages, diesel shortages specifically, which is going to drive some of those tough economics of can the distillate crack carry the gasoline crack? Middle distillate fell 459,000 barrels to 3.964. The East of Suez gas oil complex faced headwinds as supply uh, issues came from, again, the China's latest batch, but you still saw the decline. So when you see of this uh, in general, you're starting to see that come down. So the October gas oil exchange, you know, continued. We do see some of this slowdown as the Chinese product comes out. But again, we're already at such a low level, even as China really kind of captures this great market and margin, it's not really going to pivot how the world is right now. Uh, heavy resid rose 758,000 barrels. Uh, you know, when you look at it, demand at the bunk, uh, at the bunkering hub was less than average, uh, slump in flat prices. And again, you're just seeing that slowdown in trade, which is showing up in heavy disty and resid. And as middle distillates remains expensive, we're going to see more heavy disty and resid going into the uh, the power generation, especially in Central Asia. When you look at the Brent time spread, it, things have gotten a little bit weaker. You know, it, it's rallied since we took this, but still fairly flat, if you will. We don't see a huge increase in general. So staying in, in, uh, in a fairly tight range, uh, you know, coming between this 150, 165, which is going to be supportive of the current price. Now, when you look at, uh, at exports at this point in time, Norway has pushed to the highs. Uh, when you look at Angola, you saw some of that creep. Nigeria is still slow to announce, given some of the issues they're having on land, where North Sea, again, pressing higher, which will help kind of offset some of that West Africa as you have Libya coming back, and then you have CPC that will be fully functioning by the end of this week, which will help alleviate some of that pressure, keeping offsetting. So even though Nigeria's come down a bit, there's not as much demand. So, But realistically, we've seen Prices hold fairly firm in West Africa, not too much movement at this point in time. We'll get more data on Friday as the Middle East gets a little bit cheaper. Uh, Crude in Europe remains fairly flat. We don't see this adjusting too much given the issues that we're seeing on the refining side, given the uh, expensive, expensive power, lack of demand. So again, that's going to remain in a fairly stable front. As the gas oil inventory gets, goes down further, you know, lowest since 2007, moving in the wrong direction. We don't see that changing from a, uh, from a uh, European perspective, which had a uh, drop in storage about 190. But then on the flip side, you have gasoline that is back at all-time highs, uh, you know, all-time seasonal highs and right at 2020 levels. And you can see just how high 2022 is and 2020 is versus normal. So to give you an idea that you're at a very accelerated level, and as that creeps higher with demand, again, coming down seasonally speaking, because it's already started to get cold, that will put more product on the water and that'll come into the U.S. markets. It'll just come down to what is shipping as fuel oil inventory remains at 2021 levels, you know, as China increases their exports <clears throat> into a, into into Asia, and then you have more product that's available moving into from the Middle Eastern markets, that is again a, a big driver in terms of how much where can they send their fuel oil because previously it was going into Asia 
But now with China coming in, how much of that gets displaced and will some of this actually show up in the U.S. markets on top of what is already coming into pad three on the on the on the on the on the, on the uh, fuel oil side with Russia coming into Asia, China dumping into Asia, displacing Middle East pushing more into the Gulf of Mexico, again, trapping some of this in, in the European markets. When you look at Singapore, uh, a broad drop of about 2 million barrels. But again, you're still above the, that 15-year average. We don't see that adjusting because when you look, light distillate went higher, middle distillate slightly higher, resid came down. But again, when you look at the economics of it, Light distillate, you know, back to the seasonally adjusted highs and at the highest, uh, on, uh, near the highs of 2022, as gasoline demand weakens in, your, in, in Asia, uh, Asian refiners are throwing out a ton of gasoline that's just sitting there. And now on top of that, you're getting more Chinese product, which is going to make this worse as you have a very, very low middle distillate, which is driving the economics, keeping things moving through. And this is going to be the key to the cracks because if even if we, even if if this if storage remains in a bullish backdrop, well below average, but moves higher, you know, and and the Chinese product comes on top of it, you're going to get some some margin compression, and based based on where gasoline is, that margin compression can still force economic run cuts, even though we're in this storage predicament, which is going to be interesting to watch in terms of where are the economics, where's margin, what is that doing to oil demand, and it's all going to really originate with where is storage, where is China, and how are those economics look, which we're going to continue to be on top of on the EIA show. And here you see more resid going back to the to that 15-year average. We think it just stays in that average because if it goes higher, it gets cheaper. That'll pull more in for that power uh, burn, especially into Central Asia, which is struggling to source LNG and just middle distillate, ultra low sulfur, very low sulfur diesel is super expensive. <clears throat> now, when you look at North Sea floating storage, you know, creeping higher, as we've been saying, we think it stays fairly flat in here and right around those 2021 levels. And then when you look at European storage, again, right around the norm, uh, we don't see this going either way just because we do have that slow demand. We do have more production coming from the North Sea, Norway, that whole region in general, which again is going to keep things fairly firm. Uh, uh, fairly uh, elevated, uh, or I should say fairly close to average given the lack of demand internally, but it'll be that timing delay as always. So that's what we have for you uh, for the rest of the EIA show. Hopefully that was helpful. You know, if you have any questions, you can find us in the comments section, obviously on Twitter, and we hope you enjoy the uh, rest of your day. Thanks again for watching. I'm Mark Rosano, founder and CEO of C6 Capital Holdings, coming to you from Primary Vision Network.